get started. I wanted to uh, start by asking um, how many of you guys, I'm going to ask two questions. How many of you guys are familiar uh, with the details of the Joshua Glover story? How many of you guys have kind of heard that story growing up and were seeing? Okay, it's, it's probably a pretty common story told here. How many of you guys think that you know quite a bit about the Underground Railroad and how it worked? Okay, okay. Now the Underground Railroad is, is, is intimately tied into this story. Joshua Glover was a young man who was living as a slave in St. Louis, Missouri, okay? And he knew from the time that he was a very young man that he didn't want to live that life any longer. He wanted to be a free person. And he knew that there was only really one way to become a free person if you were slave at that time, and that was to run away. And so typically, um, most people who ran away did not really have help. There wasn't like a place you could go and say, okay, here's the Underground Railroad. You're the Underground Railroad guy, what do I do? That's usually not how it worked. Um, typically what happens is a person just made their escape because they didn't know anything about the Underground Railroad because it was a closely guarded secret for the most part. The people who were the conductors on the Underground Railroad, the blacks as well as whites who helped blacks escape, they didn't want anybody to know who they were. And in many years after the, the slavery ended and the Underground Railroad disappeared, there were still a lot of secrets to the Underground Railroad that had never really been told to anybody around the country. And so really the, the history of the Underground Railroad wasn't really written or talked about until many years after slavery ended in the country. Then it was okay for people to say, okay, I was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, I helped X number of people escape. Whereas people like Harriet Tubman, it was very well known that she was going back into the South helping blacks escape on a regular basis, but she was never captured. Simply because the people that were working with the Underground Railroad kept very good secrets. They were under the threat of death if people found out that they were part of this. So they were not about to tell some stranger. It was a very close-knit group of people that were involved, and they were dedicated to the extent that they were risking their lives to help people escape. So this is just one of those stories from the Underground Railroad. One of these stories that I, I found fascinating when I first learned the story of Joshua Glover. I was fascinated by two things. First, I was fascinated by its connection to Wisconsin. I hadn't really known much about the Underground Railroad and its workings in Wisconsin. I knew that there were historical markers in different places. I knew that Wisconsin was part of the Underground Railroad, but I hadn't heard any specific story about the Underground Railroad in Wisconsin. And secondly, I was really surprised that Milwaukee played a part in it. I'm, I live in Milwaukee. I've lived in Milwaukee since I was about seven years old, moved to Milwaukee in the early 70s, and I can remember all of these years I was in Milwaukee going to school until I left uh, in 1983 and eventually came back to Milwaukee in 1993. <laughs> I never heard the story of Joshua Glover. In all of those years of schooling, all of those history classes that I sat in, I never heard Joshua Glover's story. It wasn't until I became involved with America's Black Holocaust Museum and started to do the training for the other griots. Now griots are people at our museum when it was open, we had a physical facility. Those are the people that most museums refer to as docents. So we would give the tours to people at the museum. And so when I first became involved with the museum in 2002, I went through a training program where they had all of this information that I had to learn <coughs> in order to kind of talk about the things in the museum, to talk about our founder, Dr. James Cameron's story of his lynching, he survived. So it was a ton of stuff that I had to learn. Uh, and I had to learn it pretty quickly. Fortunately for me, I was pretty well versed in history because I've always loved history. And so a lot of these things I was well versed in. And then uh, uh, about a year after I became this griot and was there giving tours on a regular basis, I took over the griot training program. So I became the person that would do the training. And, and, and part of what I dedicated myself to doing at that particular point was to actually expand our base of knowledge as griots so that we could have more details about some of this history we were talking about. And most importantly, I wanted our griots to be able to tell personal stories because that's what really grabs people's attention. You can talk to them about the, the, the Constitution or you can talk to them about one of the founding fathers and, the, and, 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 and what he did related to the Constitution. That's much more interesting than reading about the Constitutional Convention. How many of you guys remember reading about that in school? Was that not boring? I mean, that stuff is boring. How many of you guys remember hearing, hearing the stories of the American Revolution? 
boring stuff. I mean, it's very interesting, but it's pretty darn boring. But then when you hear stories related to it, it's like, oh, it wasn't as boring as I thought. It's a little more interesting. So how many of you guys have heard the name Christmas Addicts before? Christmas Addicts, a lot of hands up. Christmas Addicts, I want to tell you this quick story and we'll jump back to Joshua Glover. Christmas Addicts was the first person to die in the American Revolution. He was a free black man living in Boston. You guys remember the Boston Massacre? Learning about that in history class, sitting and thinking, oh, Boston Massacre, oh, it's pretty boring. But <laughs> if they were to tell you the story of Christmas Addicts being that first person shot by those British soldiers, it would have actually made the Boston Massacre story a little bit more interesting. So that's what I like to do when I do these presentations about history. I like to pick stories. And this story to me is such a fascinating story that I wanted to just come and, and share it with people because it, it's, it's, it's just a mind blowing uh, story. Because it gives you little details of things that happened to him and some of the people that were involved in really helping him to gain his escape. So what I want to do is to, and I'm going to have to do this kind of weird because this projector is not doing what I want it to. So this is, is, a, is a, a photograph, actually a picture that was drawn of Joshua Glover by one of the people that actually helped him escape, this man by the name of Olin. He was part of this group that helped Joshua Glover escape and eventually get to Canada. And he, he gave his testimony about what happened and how they went through this process of helping Joshua Glover escape. And he drew this really, really nice picture of Joshua Glover. I'm like, man, the guy was pretty artistic. I, I mean, I, I'd probably drawn stick, stick figures or something if I was drawing a picture. But it's a very good rendition. And so Joshua Glover appeared in Racine about 1852 after escaping from St. Louis. So he was enslaved in St. Louis from the day he was born. In 1852, he decided it's, it's time for me to go. So he started to work at a sawmill uh, in town and he lived in a cabin just outside of town. And he lived a pretty normal life for a couple of years. But then in March 1854, he was at his cabin with some people he knew and some people came in and they captured him and they said, it's time for you to go back to St. Louis. And you can imagine Joshua Glover was not very happy to hear those words. So this is when it becomes interesting to me. <coughs> because I love history, I have to give you guys a little background. Okay, so we all are familiar with the fact that slavery was a legal institution in the United States for many, many years, right? The United States became an official country in terms of having a government and an entity that we could call a constitution, and not in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, but in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention. So the Constitutional Convention in 1787 is when we officially became a nation because now we had a legal document which set forth all of these different laws on the federal level. Most of us have never read much of the Constitution. We may have read little bits and pieces. Most of us are familiar with some things like the Bill of Rights, the right to bear arms, all of these different things, but we very rarely ever delve into the Constitution as a document. And so one of the things I wanted to do was kind of delve into a little bit to show you how that particular document, which hasn't changed. That's the interesting thing about the Constitution. The Constitution is the same today as it was on the day it was written. They've added some stuff to it, but they've never taken anything out of the Constitution. So that, that, that makes it very interesting to me. All of those original things that were in it are still there. Now, they've made amendments and changed things and got rid of this, that, and the other, changed certain things, but for the most part, all of those things that are in the original Constitution, there are at least 10 parts of the U.S. Constitution, as it was originally written, that are directly related to slavery. However, the word slave and the word slavery are nowhere to be found in the U.S. Constitution until 1865 with the 13th Amendment, the amendment that abos abolished slavery. That's the first time the word slave or slavery is ever in the U.S. Constitution. So why is it that our founding fathers wrote this document and talked about slavery in all of these different places, never put the word slave or slavery in the document? It goes back to 1776, the Declaration of Independence. Who can recite a little bit of it for me? Who can recite the beginning of the Declaration of Independence? And then the courts of 
That one? In the course of human events. If it was necessary. Oh. It's kind of hard, isn't it? Yeah. It's but the part that everybody remembers, what's the part that everybody remembers about the Declaration of Independence? All men are created, are created equal, right? So we have a document that says all men are created equal. Yet, 11 years later, the Constitution creates a system that makes sure that all men are not created equal or treated equally because it makes slavery a federal legally binding institution moving forward. Okay? So that's important. Yes, sir? What does it call slavery? Well, when they refer to the slaves, there are several different terms they use. One term they use is other persons. Okay? So we'll, we'll look at a little bit of what they say. Because there's one part that I think is very interesting right here. 1787, U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 2. How many people have ever read that part of the Constitution? <laughs> Nobody, right? I didn't think so. It says, no person held to service or labor in one state. No person held to service or labor in one state. No person held to service or labor. That's the nice way of saying slave. Okay? That's what it means. So I'm going to read it the way it should be read. This is how I read it when I read it. No slave in one state under the laws thereof, escaping to another, shall the consequence of any law or regulation in be discharged from slavery, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such slave may be due. So it's basically saying, that part in the U.S. Constitution said that a person who is a slave belongs to that person who owns them and nobody can help them escape. And if they do escape, they're supposed to be returned to the person who owns them. Okay? And they say it in a very nice way. If you didn't know that they were talking about slaves, you'd be like, oh, that, that sounds, I mean, some beautiful language. The founding fathers were just wordsmiths. They, they wrote so eloquently. But they did it to hide their true intentions, which is to make sure that slavery was a legally binding institution in the nation overall. Most of the states at that time had already made it a binding institution under state law. But under federal law, the Constitution made slavery a legally binding institution. 1787, the Northwest Ordinance applied the same rule to those new territories that were further west, the free territories that hadn't been <coughs> formed into states yet. Another thing, 1793, Fugitive Slave Law only required proof of ownership to recapture somebody. So you could draw up a phony ownership document and you could go to Boston and you could go to any black person that was there and say, you belong to me. How many of you guys have seen 12 Years a Slave? The movie 12 Years a Slave. I, it, it's, it's a great movie. It's a very difficult movie to watch though. I mean, I, 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 I've watched and read and learned tons of stuff about slavery over the years, but it's one thing to read about it it's another thing to kind of see it portrayed in the way they portrayed it in the film. I thought they did a wonderful job. You know, there have been critics of it, blah, 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 whatever. But I think that the, 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 the key point with that movie, the thing that touched me the most when I saw it, was that it showed that it was very easy for a free black person to be turned into a slave just like that. Just like that, and there was nothing they could really do about it. So. This Fugitive Slave Law, 1793, also led to increased kidnapping of free blacks in the North. So six years after the Constitution was adopted, became this federally mandated slavery, you had this Fugitive Slave Law, which basically pushed people to go and kidnap blacks because it was very, very easy, okay? So that's the legal foundation of it. And then later on we'll see the details of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, which went into much more detail about what you could do with these fugitives, okay? Does anybody have any questions thus far? Yes, sir? Uh, that the Northwest Ordinance, did that help keep slaves out of this territory? Well, most of the people paying up was under the impression that they were free. Well, what happens is that you could come, but if you were a slave in another state, because of the Constitution, this Article 4, Section 2, it didn't matter where you went. You were still legally a slave, even if you had escaped. So here you are in a slave state, and you jump over to a free territory. Oh well, you're still a slave under the U.S. Constitution. 
Article 4, Section 2. Red Scott, he sued, he claimed he was in a free state, so he should be free. Absolutely. And, and what was the outcome? No he lost. <laughs> he lost. <laughs> and he lost based on this part of the Constitution. When you look at the case, the, the, the Supreme Court ruled in that particular case that this made it so that he had no chance of winning. Okay? Because it was still legally binding. There was another hand up. Yes, sir. Uh, it's just something that only required to take someone only required proof of ownership? Yes. What, was this all just uh, faked? Could be completely faked? Yeah, it, it was no, no one really, if, if you... Record keeping. If, if you brought a document yeah. to a sheriff in Racine, yeah. right? And you said that this person is the person that I own yeah. and he's escaped from me six months ago. They're gonna look at it and say, okay, we're gonna issue yeah. a warrant. You can go out and capture the person and then they're gonna, that's gonna be it. And no that's the way it was standards. all around the country. No real standards to say. No, they, the law was there. Yeah. That said that it had to be some type of legal proof. But I mean, who's really checking? What's legal? Who really cared to check? Because you know, it, it, it didn't really make a difference. So it was very easy for blacks to be kidnapped. So that's, that's the legal foundation of why uh, it was so easy for him to get caught up. Now, more importantly, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law was more directly related to Joshua Glover's case because this was really just a few years before he was captured, okay? So let's go over that. It's stated in this law that court commissioners were empowered to act as judges. So what they were given the power to do is be a judge that could issue a certificate to a person who says, okay, here's my ownership papers of this particular person. I want them back. Give me the right to get them back. And that court commissioner would write out this document and say, here you go, you have this paperwork that says you can take that person back to wherever you want to take them. So the court commissioners received that very strong power. Slave owners would then issue these claim certificates, which is legally binding. All federal marshals in the country, all of them were required to follow the orders of these court commissioners. And if they didn't do it, they could go to prison or face a fine. So even if you felt that well, this guy's really, I know that he's not a person who was a slave. I've known him since the day he was born. I know he's been a free person since the day he was born, but if there's a piece of paper that says otherwise, as a U.S. Marshal, you have to follow the law and you have to arrest that person. You don't have a choice. And if you decide not to, well, they'll just give you a thousand dollar fine. And believe me, a thousand dollars is a lot of money back at that time. It's a lot of money now, but back then, holy cow, twenty thousand dollars worth in today's money. So. Marshall was also liable for the full value of the escapee. So imagine you're a marshal, and you go out and you capture this person. And you're supposed to bring this person back and turn him in so he can be returned down south, and that person escapes. Well, guess what? You are now liable to the person who owned him. So if that guy that you let escape was placing the value on this individual as $1,000 or $2,000 or whatever it is, you have to pay that person as a U.S. Marshal. So do you think the U.S. Marshals are going to take a chance and let somebody <coughs> escape easily? Probably not. They wouldn't do everything in their power to make sure once they caught you that they were going to keep you. Okay? Another thing. No fugitive could testify in court. So even if you knew that you were a free person and they had this documentation, they captured you, you went to court, and you could get up and say, listen man, I have 50 people that know I was free, I can call them all, they would not let you stand up in a court of law and testify. You couldn't do it. So even if you had proof, and you could tell me that proof, it didn't matter because you couldn't go into a court and say that, listen, you couldn't go into the court and do it. So that made it even more difficult. In addition to that, there's a thousand dollar fine and six month jail sentence for harboring aiding or abetting a fugitive. So anybody on the Underground Railroad that was captured could face a thousand dollar fine and six months in jail just for helping somebody. Letting them stay in your house and eat a sandwich for an hour. Thousand dollar fine, six months in jail. So you see the difficulty that these people in the Underground Railroad face based on the laws. Here's the slave law, 1850. Commissioners were paid. Now this is the key part. 
the commissioners were paid five dollars if they didn't issue a certificate to take that person away. However, if they issued a certificate to take that person away, they got ten dollars. Hmm. <laughs> Financial incentive to give the certificate? Does it sound like a... Now listen, if I went to you, sir, and said, I'll give you $5 for that hat if you keep it, but if you give it to me, I'll give you $10. What are you going to do with the hat? You're going to give it to me, right? <laughs> it only makes sense. So this law made it so that these commissioners were not going to screw themselves over by not issuing these certificates. They were making more money by issuing the certificates. And that's a very important part of this. The reason I wanted to introduce you guys to this law is because it, it kind of puts you in the mindset of where everybody, all of these players were in these stories during slavery. It wasn't just old Joshua Glover, it was all of these people around the country that had to follow this law. This was a law of the land. You couldn't get around it. There was no way to get around it. Or at least people thought there was no way to get around it. <clears throat> Joshua Glover had a different idea though. Underground Railroad. One of the things that I found out about the Underground Railroad that really shocked me was I always heard that the Underground Railroad was getting to freedom up north, to Canada, right? Now imagine you're in Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> up north is a long way away. Canada is really a long way away, right? Or imagine if you're from a little town like I lived in, Charleston, Mississippi, which is up in the northern part of the state of Mississippi, about 70 miles south of Memphis, Tennessee. The north is pretty far away. And I can attest to that because I've driven from Milwaukee to Charleston, Mississippi, numerous times back and forth, 700 and some odd miles. It's a long way in a car. I'm sitting in the car, relaxing, the heat is on, music is playing, I'm having a good time. Imagine if I had to walk 700 miles. Man, 700 miles is a long way to walk. So it's going to be a very difficult journey. So if you're actually in the south, the deep south, you are more likely to try to go south to escape than to go north. Mm. Because the Underground Railroad worked both ways. You could go to the south, somewhere on the Gulf of Mexico, or even in the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean, get on a boat and escape that way if you were in the deep south. And one of the reasons that that was probably, I'll get right to you, most of the time when someone escaped, if they lived in the, in, the, in the northern part of the slavery states, they threaten you that if you escape, we're going to send you down south. They were going to send you deeper into the south. That was a threat that they made to people who were, were people who were trying to escape on a regular basis. We're going to send you deeper south. So let's just say you were in Virginia and you ran away a couple times. Well, guess what? We're going to sell your little behind down in Louisiana somewhere or down to Mobile, Alabama, or Charleston, Mississippi, or someplace like that. So they were gonna threaten you with going even further south, which made it harder for you to escape north, but it made it easier for you to escape going south. But it was very, very few that actually took the southern route. So what did the Underground Railroad consist of? Series of safe houses and conductors. These conductors, blacks as well as whites, were people who were risking their livelihoods, <coughs> risking their lives in many respects, to help people escape a legal institution. And that's the thing that I always want to emphasize to people. Slavery was a legal institution under federal law and under the laws of 15 states when the Civil War began in 1861. It was a legal institution. Even though we look back on it now and we say, oh, that was just horrible, it was horrendous, I can't believe that. The reality is it was a legally binding institution under federal law and state law. And to violate that by being a conductor, you were risking jail time and possibly death. Because there were people involved with the Underground Railroad who were captured and killed because they were parts of it. And they were, in many cases, I, I remember this one account I read, is one gentleman who had been involved for about 10 years and had helped a lot of people escape. And somehow word got out that he was a part of the Underground Railroad. No one really knew exactly how word got out, but there was a group of people that came in the middle of the night to his house, took him away, and he was never heard from again. A, a, a young white man in his early 30s who was doing what he thought was the right thing, helping these slaves escape. And his wife and children were, were left without their father and their husband. 
simply because he was doing what he thought was the right thing. But what he was doing was illegal under federal and state law. It was illegal to help black people who were slaves escape. It was illegal against the law. The path to escape included going up north to Canada, but sometimes south. And even when we look at Canada, Canada wasn't a land of freedom until the 1830s. Canada was a part of the British Empire. The British Empire decided in 1833, I believe, to outlaw slavery in all of their overseas possessions. So up until 1833, Canada was not the place to go because slavery was still perfectly legal in Canada. Even though it was a much smaller type of slavery there, because they didn't have the, the, you know, the cash crops there, but it still existed there. So it wasn't a place, man, let me escape from Mississippi. Let me run for six months to get to Canada. Ooh, I'm in Canada. Oh, I'm a slave in Canada. That would be kind of stupid, right? So it wasn't a land of freedom for long. But after the 1830s, many, many people took that path. All right. Can you um, describe Florida, the lines in Florida? Oh, yeah, let me go back. So Florida. Florida was a place that you could go to and escape in two different ways. You could escape by going into the areas where the Native American presence there really was very strong and they had lots of free blacks that came and became parts of, of their communities became parts of their community and stayed in those communities many, many years later, intermarried with the people in those communities. It was a safe place to go. It was a part of, of, of a Spanish uh, overseas possession for many, many years before it became a part of the United States. And the Native American tribes there were very much against slavery. They didn't believe in slavery as an institution and they welcomed these blacks who had escaped with open arms. And they also were part of the Underground Railroad, whites who eventually moved there, many of them Spanish who really believed that slavery was wrong. And so what they did, they became parts of the Underground Railroad in Florida. And they actually helped blacks escape through the sea route to get on boats to go, I mean, in many cases, well not many, but in some cases, to, to just completely leave America altogether and to go to Europe or go somewhere in the Caribbean. Any place other than here is, is the refrain that a lot of people say. So Florida played a really, really big part in helping people escape in a couple of different ways. So we're going to talk about the first escape. <coughs> the first escape for Joshua Glover. Okay. So May 15, 1852, he had been thinking about this and thinking about this and thinking about this for a long time. And believe me, I think all of us, if we were placed in his position or a position of anyone at that particular time who was enslaved, you will be thinking about two things on a regular basis. How to stay alive and how to get free. Those are two things you're thinking about all the time. When you're out there in the field picking cotton, you're thinking about how to stay alive and how to get free. My mother grew up in Mississippi as a young girl. She picked cotton. That was one of the jobs she had during cotton picking season. She picked cotton, and she's told me these stories about the cotton many times. Her and both of her sisters picked cotton, and it, it, the, the place I'm from in Mississippi is in the northern part of the Mississippi Delta, some of the primest cotton growing land on the, on the planet Earth. And so she would tell me how difficult picking cotton was. There were different varieties of cotton, and my mother-in-law, she's from southern Georgia, we went to southern Georgia on a trip, a uh, family reunion. My wife had a family reunion down there. We went down there, and I mean, it's cotton everywhere. And, and one of her relatives, uh, I spoke to them. It wasn't cotton season when we were there, but it was a lot of places where you knew they were, they were growing cotton. So I, I had them send me some cotton from southern Georgia. And that particular variety that they sent me was a variety that actually is very similar to a rose bush has thorns in it. So imagine if you were a person who's in this place where the cotton crop has these thorns in it and you have to pick this stuff and you're getting pricked in the hands on a regular basis and you, you just have to work through it. I mean, there's no, you know, you can't say, you know, uh, I injured myself, I don't want to work for the rest of the day. It just didn't work that way. So cotton picking, depending on where you were, could be either really, really bad 
or horrendously bad, depending on the particular type of cotton. So, Joshua Glover is thinking time after time again, how do I get out of this? How do I escape? And he thought about it. He thought about, well, which direction do I go? What route do I take? When do I leave? Do I leave early in the morning? Do I leave late at night? What? He didn't tell anybody, though. He was smart. He did not tell a single soul that he was planning to escape. He didn't tell anybody anywhere. He just did it. In the middle of one night, he packed up some stuff and he started walking. And he walked 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 for about seven weeks. Seven weeks. Remember, if you were escaping, you weren't going to take the main road, walk along the side of the main road. You were going through the wooded area. You were going through desolate areas where you may not be able to find something to eat. He went, one, one period of time, he, he told some friends after he escaped, he went through a period where he didn't eat for like three days. He had no food for three days. He was starving. There were wild animals that he had to, to, to kind of escape from, rivers and streams that he had to cross, mountains that he had to walk over. It was very, very difficult. But he made it in about seven weeks. Now, the day after he escaped, his owner, a guy by the name of B.S. Garland, offered a $200 reward for the return of his escaped slave. Okay, and so obviously, the man knew that Joshua Glover was gone. They put together a group to try to search for him, and they didn't find him. About seven weeks later, he arrived in Racine. Slaves who escaped, these fugitives they were called, usually were able to travel anywhere from eight to 10 miles a day on average. So imagine, if I was to try to leave from St. Louis and come to Racine, I know, because I've been to St. Louis before, I know that St. Louis is about 300 miles from Milwaukee. So it's almost 300 miles from St. Louis to Racine. And imagine walking that entire distance and it taking you seven weeks. And it has to be pretty heroic because you know that there's a possibility that somebody is very close behind you trying to find you. There's always a possibility you may run into somebody that may turn you in to get the reward. So it is very harrowing experience, but Joshua, and he wasn't Joshua Glover at this time, by the way. One of the things that I, that, that I think is really important for people to know is that when you look back at people who were slaves, legally binding institution, I was fortunate enough when I was tracing my family history that I ran across a woman on this one website. I, I found out the name of the man who owned my family in Mississippi, a man by the name of Dempsey Diltz. Came over from Germany, bought some slaves in South Carolina, eventually about 10 years later moved to Mississippi with them and own my family. My, my family on my mother's side are, are the Dilts, D-I-L-T-Z. And so I, I decided to trace my family's history and I was <clears throat> fortunate enough to go back and find the name of the guy that owned my family, which most people aren't lucky enough to find out. But I was running across this guy's name and I wanted to know more about him. So I left the message on the message board, genealogy uh, message board, and this woman contacted me. She was like the great, 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 great granddaughter of Dempsey Dilts. And so her and I shared all this information. She shared with, with me her entire family history of Dempsey Dilts, because she had been tracing her family history. So she sent me this huge packet of information, and I mean, I was just, I was blown away because now I could kind of connect my history and my family to not just slaves, but to actually go back and say, okay, these are people with names. And I was able to kind of go back and start to find out names. And what, what they had up until slavery ended in 1865, the, the U.S. Census is done every 10 years. They had what they call a slave schedule. It's a document that listed each slave that a person owned. So they go from, from, from county to county, city to city, and they document the slaves that you own. So let's just say you have 10 slaves. I think Dempsey Diltz, at his peak, he owned uh, something like 22, 23 slaves. So I'm able to look at this slave schedule, and they have, on this document, they have their first names. No, they don't. They don't have their names. There are no names. If you're a slave, you don't have a name in the U.S. Census. There's no name there. It's just male, female, and age. That's it. No names. So these are nameless people. They have names, but they're nameless on these slave schedules. So not only were they nameless on the slave schedules, but they didn't really have an official last name. 
Imagine that. They didn't have an official last name. Joshua <laughs> changed his name once he came to Racine to Glow. So he traveled this distance. He finally gained his freedom <laughs> after this long, treacherous <laughs> journey. He got to Racine. <laughs> And he was able to live like a normal person for a while. For a good two years. He did a couple odd jobs here and there, but eventually he was able to hook up with a job at the sawmill. He changed his name to Glover. He gave himself a last name. For the first time in his life, he had a last name that he could claim as his own. And he got it from the name of a woman who had owned it previously by the name of Martha Glover. So about two years, he, he lived in fear because he knew that there was always a chance that they come looking for him. And it seems hard to imagine that somebody that's 300 miles away would be able to find you, would even have an idea of where you moved to, right? Imagine, imagine if, if, if someone came from St. Louis and they moved to Racine, just seeing the anonymous person. Imagine somebody in St. Louis being able to figure out and that person has moved to Racine. It's pretty easy nowadays. I mean, you can check phone records, you know, look in the yellow page or the white pages. You can find people. But back at that time, imagine how hard it was. So it makes me wonder, how the heck did they find this guy? How did they know he was in Racine? You know how they found out? The guy was a very popular person. People loved Joshua Glover. He was a good guy. People were talking about, oh, this guy's a great guy. And so what happens is, among people where they were seen, there were people who were always here looking for escaped slaves. Because they knew by reputation that Racine, this area, was a very strong part of the Underground Railroad. So people who were looking for escaped slaves would come and they would have conversations in the barbershop or in the local saloon with people. And they'd get information and that's how they heard about this guy by the name of Joshua who was living here and he fit the description. So they sent information back to Mr. Garland and said, we found him. We know where he is. He's in Racine, okay? So they made plans then to, to come and get him. So at the time, there was only about 100 black people living in Racine. Only about 100, so it was a close-knit community. Joshua Glover was a very popular guy. You know, he had just a regular job. He wasn't a, you know, a big wig or anything. He didn't have his own business or anything. But he was a guy who was well thought of in the community by blacks as well as whites. So when they came to get him, it wasn't hard to find him. But as always, when these types of things happen, there's always somebody that's going to tell. And so what happens is, This guy, who used to own him, Mr. Garland, arrived in Milwaukee, went to the courthouse there and received a warrant to go after Joshua Glover. He had his ownership certificate. He was ready to go after him. He brought some guys with him to go and capture Joshua Glover because he wasn't going to try to do it himself. They put together a posse, including this guy by the name of Dover, or Daniel Housen, who was known as the slave catcher of Dover. This guy had been around the country famous for being very good at catching escaped slaves. That was his area of expertise. And so he brought some, 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 some you know, heavyweights with him to come and get Joshua Glover. He went to the courthouse in Milwaukee, got the paperwork, and decided to go to Racine and get Joshua Glover. So what happened? Joshua Glover had a buddy of his by the man, uh, a guy by the name of Nelson Turner, who he had known, you know, most of the time he had been uh, in Racine, living as a free person, as a fugitive, and, uh, you know, this black guy was, was, would come over his, his cabin, and they would, you know, sit around, and they'd have conversations, and they'd drink, and they'd play cards, a variety of different things. Well, uh, Mr. Turner heard that there was a reward, $200, for the capture of Joshua. He said, oh, $200, Ooh, that's pretty good money. And so what he did was he set him up. He set up a card game at Joshua Glover's place, and he made sure that Joshua Glover got plenty of liquor in his system while they were playing cards, okay? So they're sitting, having a good time, laughing, drinking, ah, and all of a sudden, somebody bursts through the door, and it's Mr. Garland, and a U.S. Marshal by the name of Cotton. 
They arrested Glover after beating him pretty badly. They pistol whipped him. He was pretty groggy. They threw him in a, in a little wagon and they drove off in the middle of the night. Now one of the things that, that really kind of hurt them in terms of the way they captured Joshua Glover was the fact that people heard that they brutalized him. That they beat him very badly. Now, this is a guy that was very popular in Racine. Everybody who knew him liked the guy. So it's one thing to hear about some guy that's, that's a person that's not popular that nobody really likes and you hear about them getting beat down, eh, it's not a big deal. But a guy that is considered to be such a nice person and you capture him and you don't just capture him and put him in handcuffs and, and drive him off, you beat this guy bloody. Knock him unconscious. And the people in Racine looked at that as not being captured, legally captured. You know how they saw it? Kidnapped. They saw it as him being kidnapped. They said, look, this, this is a resident of Racine, a well-respected individual in our community, and some people came in the middle of the night and kidnapped him. They were not happy. They were not happy at all. Even though the law said it didn't matter. The law said they had every right to do what they did. The people in Racine said, we don't care about the law. That doesn't matter to us. This was a good guy. They came and they beat this man with a pistol. They left him bloody and unconscious. And he's a part of our community. We're going to do something to help him. We're not going to just let these people come and kidnap one of our citizens of Racine. We're not going to stand for it. That's what they said. And they believed it. They not only said it, but they believed it and they acted on it. So, word spread around Racine. One of the local papers here, the editor contacted local paper in Milwaukee. Word spread to Milwaukee because that's where they were taking him to the jail. Now, they made a huge mistake. They made two huge mistakes. One was beating up Joshua Glover and having people find out that they beat him. Number two was that this is about 2 o'clock in the morning when they captured him. They, instead of taking a direct route to Milwaukee, they figure, well, you know, people are upset. We're going to take this circuitous route and get around all that. They ran into Mother Nature. Mm. A bad storm happened, and the roads were impassable, and it took them forever to get to Milwaukee. <laughs> and as a result of that, it gave the people in Racine and the people in Milwaukee time to find out what happened. And as a result, the largest group to ever assemble in Racine met in Haymarket Square demanding that we do something about this kidnapping of Joshua Glover. What are we going to do? I don't know. I know what we're going to do. We're going to go and get him. We're going to go and demand his freedom. We're going to go to Milwaukee and we're going to go to that courthouse. We're going to demand that they give this man his freedom because they didn't go through the legal process of doing what they did. They kidnapped him in the middle of the night. And so this group left on the boat, went to Milwaukee, and the sheriff in town had actually issued a warrant for the people who had taken him for assault. Yes, sir. Uh, you said there, the number of people that was in Milwaukee, you said it was 100 people, and he was 1% of that. No, in, in Racine, there was 100 in black Racine. people living in Racine. But there's a hundred men from Racine arrived in Milwaukee. Most of them were so, white. So everybody that was lit at the time. No, there were a hundred black men. There were a hundred black people living in Racine. Oh. Which was one percent of the population. Okay. Now this big crowd of a hundred men, they were mostly community leaders from around Racine. They got together and said we're gonna go to Milwaukee and demand this man's freedom. And that's exactly what they did. So they gathered together and they brought with them the sheriff who had a warrant for the arrest of Mr. Garland and Marshall Cotton for assaulting Joshua Glover. So they had an arrest warrant in hand when they got there. Yes, sir. I just want to ask, you said 100 people was 1% of Racine's population. So there was a, uh, excuse my math, if it's yeah, wrong, there was, was 10,000 people in Racine. Yeah. That's right, OK. I actually would have been wrong, so thanks for. OK, we'll get the math. <laughs> Doug, right here in the hat. So, so, so here we have this, this group of 100 men who, who pretty much been been selected by the community leaders to go and fight for Joshua Glover. They have a warrant for the arrest of Marshall Cotton as well as Mr. Garland on assault charges because they beat the crap 
excuse my language, they beat the crap out of Joshua Glover. And the people in the scene were very upset about that. So, a local judge issued a writ of habeas corpus, which is ignored by the federal marshals. Federal marshals said, well, we don't care what this stupid judge is saying. He's in the jail. We have a document that says we can take him. We are going to take him. He's going to go to court on Monday morning in front of a judge. We're going to present our case, and we're going to leave with Joshua Glover. That's what their plan was. We're going to go to court on Monday morning at 10 o'clock, and we're going to present our case, and we'll be off in a short period of time with Joshua Glover. Okay? Well, the people in Racine, the people in Milwaukee said, well, that's what you think is going to happen. You think you're going to take Joshua Glover, but guess what? We have other plans. When they found out that these federal marshals basically told the judge that we don't care about what you say, we don't care about the fact that you said this man should be free, that they should go through a process in a different way, and until that process is gone through, that this man should be led away as a free person. We don't care. This is what the federal marshal said. We don't care about your laws in Wisconsin. It's Wisconsin. It's Wisconsin. <laughs> I love Wisconsin. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, people from other states, Wisconsin? Really? Wisconsin? I mean, you guys know the stereotypes about Wisconsin? We all eat a, too much cheese, drink too much beer. I can remember when I was a young man and, and I was living in California. I would tell people I'm from Milwaukee. They're like, Milwaukee? Oh, Milwaukee! Laverne and Shirley! Happy days! They're like, they have black people in Milwaukee? I never saw any on happy days. And I always reminded them, there was this one black guy in the last couple seasons on happy days. I never saw a black person on Laverne and Shirley. But Outside of Wisconsin, <laughs> people, you know, say a lot of crazy stuff about Wisconsin. But once they come and visit and they see how warm and welcoming the people of Wisconsin are, they leave and they say, Wisconsin, what a nice place. I like those Wisconsin nights. So anyway, these people didn't respect Wisconsin and they're lost. So they basically told this judge, we don't care what you say. We're not going to allow you to let Joshua Glover go free. We're going to just take him and he'll be on his way back with us. Um, yes, sir. In case anybody doesn't know, Haymarket Square, that's Monument Square downtown. Good point. And they have a marker down there dedicated to this group of 100. And a crowd of 5,000 people gathered in Milwaukee at the county jail. And they said, these federal marshals are going to go into court on Monday morning and we know this judge is going to allow them to take Joshua Glover away. Because he's basically said so much. I'm going to let them take him. And they said, well, we know what the judge said, but we're not going to allow it to happen. So what they did, they went and they busted down the front door of the county jail in Milwaukee. Literally knocked it off of his hinges. Went in grabbed Joshua Glover and he was taken away <laughs> to a place that at that time was called Prairieville. It's called Waukesha now. Or as people outside of Wisconsin call it, Waukesha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they took him to Prairieville. I can remember, it, 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 it's tragic that I remember this, but remember the, the, the spa shooting uh, a number of years ago? And I'm watching CNN. And, and you know, this is, this is a huge story around the country, and, and I keep hearing these people on CNN say, in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Waukesha? Really? <laughs> can y'all, like, can you call somebody in Waukesha and ask them how it's pronounced? I mean, really? Waukesha? I mean, I know it looks like Waukesha, but come on, man. They do that with sports. <laughs> <laughs> they really mess up. Yes, sir. Just some clarification on a few things. How do you pronounce location? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, for, so the 5,000 that gathered um, at the county jail, the 5,000 were helping to? Bring, yeah. Okay. They were there to make sure he was busted out. Okay. This includes the 100 from Mercy. Okay. And, 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 and word spread around Milwaukee. There was a lot of compatriots in Milwaukee who wanted to assist them in making sure that Glover would get his freedom. And so, so there was there was 100 who came from Racine with the, the gathering in Monument Square, then Haymarket Square, how many people were 
gathered at that original. That they gathered it. I've looked and there's no specific number, but they say that it was close to a thousand people. Okay. Close to a thousand people. Okay. Yes, sir. What I'm trying to understand, though, is it sounds like a hundred people from Racine plus 4,900 from Milwaukee are going to help turn him free? Yes, sir. This is what happened. People from Racine who knew Joshua Glover and, 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 and consider him a, a respected member of their community wanted to make sure that they went to Milwaukee to present their case that he was kidnapped. And so they got a group of the leading citizens that went on this small boat, took the trip to Milwaukee to present their case, and by the time they got there, word had spread around Milwaukee, and there was a lot of people in Milwaukee that were in support. But then when they heard that the federal marshals were going to ignore this writ of habeas corpus, which was going to let Joshua Glover go free until this case went to court, when they heard that the federal marshals were going to ignore that, then even more people came and said, we have to do something different. And what they decided to do was to, to knock the hinges off of that door, go into the jail, and take him out so that he could gain his freedom. So. He went from Waukesha, which was pretty real at the time, <laughs> to a little town called Rochester, which is just south of it, and kind of almost directly east of Racine. He stayed there overnight. They brought him back to Racine. Why would they bring him back to Racine? Anybody, imagine, why would they bring him back to Racine? Does that sound kind of crazy that they're gonna bring him back to Racine? Why do you guys think they brought him back to Racine? Because of the lake. Because of the lake? Because he lived there. Mm -hmm. Because they knew that was the last place they would look for him. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, oh. Yeah, okay, he escaped from Milwaukee. Yeah, let's go check Racine. Maybe he went back home to, 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 to get a pair of boxer shorts or something and he left, you know. <laughs> of course they wouldn't think he would be back in Racine. So they brought him back to Racine and they, they someone mentioned a boat. They were trying to get a boat to take him from Racine across the lake and get him to freedom, but they had some issues with the boat. So what they did, they, they brought him back to a little town called Spring Prairie, which is, is close to Burlington. And he actually stayed there in Spring Prairie for a little while, while they went through and tried to come up with this new plan. There were several people that they kept handing him off to during this process. And eventually, they brought him back to Racine, and he spent several weeks in Racine before they were finally able to get this boat for him, and he got on the boat, and he went off and made it all the way to Canada through you know, the rest of the Underground Railroad and he lived uh, as a free person as a result of that. So a very kind of weird route that he took to get to freedom. So let's look at the ramifications of this case on Wisconsin law. Because Wisconsin <laughs> did something that was very odd, uh, that wasn't really done very often. First of all, Mr. Garland and, and his aides were arrested by the sheriff of Racine for assault. Remember, they got the warrant from a judge in Racine. They had beaten Joshua Glover up. They went. The sheriff from Racine came. He was part of the 100. And they arrested them. And these guys are like, you have the audacity to arrest us for beating up a fugitive slave? Are you kidding me? They went to court, and they asked the judge to release them. And the judge said, okay, we'll release them. So they were released very quickly. Sherman Booth, who was one of the leaders of this group in Milwaukee, he, he, he wrote for this paper, he was the editor of a paper in Milwaukee, and he was one of the kind of the ringleaders that led this group to bust into the jail and get him out. So he was pointed out, and he was arrested. And several other people were arrested, and they were charged with violating the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 which basically said you could not aid or assist a slave who was a fugitive in escaping. So Sherman Booth, this really, you know, a giant in Milwaukee's history, was arrested for helping this man get out of jail. And he was like, holy cow, I didn't do it. He said, I didn't, he went to court and said, I didn't do it. I was there at the meeting when they talked about it, but I didn't do it. And of course, they just ignored him. He was arrested, he was convicted, well not really convicted, something that was close to being convicted, which basically, it may as well have been a conviction, they basically never really allowed him to go to court. He was thrown in prison, and he never saw a day in court. 
He stayed locked up in prison for violating the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, and he didn't get out until 1861. He was pardoned by, and I'll show you guys who he was pardoned by, one of our presidents, two days before Lincoln became president, Sherman Booth was pardoned. But this, this is really kind of interesting. President Buchanan pardoned him two days before Lincoln became president. He appealed for a writ of habeas corpus to get out. It was denied. He spent year after year after year in federal prison. The interesting thing that came out of it was that he challenged it in court. And it went to the US, or the, the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled in favor of Booth that he had every right to do what he had done. Even though it was a violation of the federal Fugitive Slave Act, Wisconsin Supreme Court basically told the U.S. government, we know that the Fugitive Slave Act is a law, it's a binding law, federal law, but in Wisconsin, we don't care. It's null and void. It's unconstitutional in this state. That's what the Wisconsin Supreme Court said. That was the first time a state had wagged their finger at the federal courts and said to the U.S. government, we know this law is on the books and it's been on the books for a while, but we don't care. In this state, it's unconstitutional. And as a result of us saying it's unconstitutional, this man had every right to do what he did. Sherman Booth should be given his freedom. So they wagged their finger at the federal government and said, we don't care, it's unconstitutional. And they were the first and only state to do that. The first and only state in the country to challenge the Fugitive Slave Act and say it was unconstitutional. Now, we know how the federal government works. They don't really care what Wisconsin says, what their Supreme Court says, because it was still a legally binding institution. The Fugitive Slave Act was still legally binding around the country. So basically what they said was that, you know what? You may tell us that it's unconstitutional. You may tell us that you're gonna allow people to violate this law, but if we capture them, they're gonna to go to federal prison. And Mr. Booth went to federal prison, and he stayed in federal prison until he was pardoned in 1861, two days before Lincoln became president. So Booth was never prosecuted. He was basically arrested, charged. He but, never- But never had a trial? No. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's crazy. But that's what they did to him. And the federal judge denied a writ of habeas corpus to even bring up, okay. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, but yeah, that's crazy. exactly what happened. That's why some of his compatriots challenged him. So the final outcomes, Lover lived as a free man in Canada. He died on June 3rd or 4th. Some people say it was the 4th, some people say it was the 3rd of 1888. So as we look back on all of these events, um, in the life of Joshua Glover, there's a couple things I want to, to, to emphasize that I think are very, very important that really kind of relate to, to kind of our mission at the Black Holocaust Museum. Part of our mission, our founder, Dr. James Cameron, survived the lynching at the age of 16 in a little town in Indiana, Marion, Indiana. He was, as far as we know, the only known living survivor of a lynching until he passed away at the age of 90, 92 back in 2003. He spent four years in prison in Indiana as an accessory after the fact of murder. So he did these four years. He was a very angry young man when he got out. But he decided to dedicate himself to becoming a better person to make amends for the crime that he had participated in even though he had left before his two friends shot and killed this man by the name of Claude Dieter, he decided that he was going to take that forgiveness that he had been given by Mr. Dieter's family and the way he was treated by the warden of the prison he was in, who treated him extremely well, allowed him to go and run errands for him, deliver mail, all of these different things. He, he realized when he, was, when he was in prison those four years that he was very angry, that people tried to kill him, that they put a rope around his neck and were about to lynch him and kill him, and they had already killed his two friends, and they brought him up right next to the tree, and he's looking up at his two friends hanging from this tree dead, and imagine the anger he had, because he said many of these people that he saw in the crowd that were spitting on him, beating him, kicking him, calling him all kinds of names, were people that he knew, people that he considered to be friends of his, and he had all of that anger inside of him. 
all of this just tremendous anger. And so he's sitting in prison and he's angry and, and, and he realized at some point because of that white warden treating him so well, he said, man, why am I mad at every white person? It's crazy for me to be mad at every white person because not all of them feel the way that that group of 15,000 or so felt at that courthouse in Marion, Indiana. I have to forgive these people who tried to kill me. I have to find that forgiveness in my heart and realize that I need to reconcile those differences that I have. And so when he created America's Black Holocaust Museum, part of his mission was to obviously to document this history and share it with the public, but more importantly to offer a safe place for people to come and talk about these parts of American history so that you can have a comfortable conversation without feeling like, man, if I say the wrong thing, then somebody's going to point their finger and call me this and the other. We wanted the museum to be a place, and, and once we reopen in a, in a physical facility again, which is going to happen, I can't say when, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We wanted to continue to be that type of place. I was fortunate enough when I was there as a griot for the last, basically the last six years the museum was open, giving tours. And I was there practically every Saturday from the time we opened to the time we closed giving tours. I would be there during the week occasionally giving tours. And I had, you know, family reunion groups. I had, when I was there during the week, I had people that would bring uh, students from schools. Uh, I would have professors who would bring some of their students from colleges around the country, around the state. And, and, and I mean, it was amazing to me how people from other countries, other countries would find out about this little museum, because it wasn't very big, this little museum in Milwaukee, founded by this, this man who never really had much money and never made any money from the museum. But everybody in Milwaukee is so long, he made all that money. He never made any money for the museum. But this little institution was so powerful, it drew people from around the world. Because people wanted to hear what? The stories. The stories. They wanted to hear the stories. And that's the drawing power, to hear the stories. We would tell the stories of people who were lynched. We would tell Dr. Cameron's story, obviously. We would tell the stories of other people who were lynched. We would tell the history of Jim Crow, where the term comes from. We would tell the history of the segregation laws and how those laws changed in the course of the year. One of the things that I used to love talking to people about was presidential ownership of slaves. If you look at the first 16 U.S. presidents, 12 of the first 16 were owners of black people. 12 of the first 16 were owners of black people. The one who owned the most was our first president, George Washington. Over the course of his life, he owned nearly 400 black people. Thomas Jefferson was the second most slave-owning president. He owned somewhere in the middle, uh, mid-200s. And those are things that we don't learn in our history classes, but they really impact how we look back on this history and how we not necessarily um, gauge the importance of people, but really it gives you uh, uh, the ability to see people differently than what you've been taught. Because I can remember, for instance, I can remember being taught for many, many years, and I still hear it all the time, uh, Abraham Lincoln is a great emancipator. He's a great emancipator. He freed the slaves. And you would think from all of this, this, these things that I learned, he freed the slaves because he, 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 he felt bad for them, he loved them, he wanted them to be free. But that's not what it was in reality. Lincoln had views on slavery and he had views on slaves. They were not the same. He hated slavery as an institution because he knew that it was an institution that was ripping the nation apart from its foundation. One of those kind of hidden parts of the U.S. Constitution that nobody really pays attention to. When it was written in 1787, there was a debate about the importation of slaves. Okay, it was perfectly legal to import Africans, continue to import Africans into the country. But the northern states, who had by that time pretty much gotten rid of slavery, did not want the southern states to continue importing blacks in. And there was a very specific reason. You guys have probably heard of the three-fifths clause of the Constitution, which most people misinterpret as saying that blacks were three-fifths of a person. That's not the way it worked. This is the way it worked. 
when the government was set up and they set up the House of Representatives, it's based on the population in each state. So the larger your population is, the more representatives you have in the House of Representatives, right? So the northern states knew that they could count everybody in their states, and the southern states were like, well, we can count everybody too, including the slaves. Even though they don't have a legal name or anything else, we can count them too. And then all the states were like, no, nah, I don't think you should be able to count them. Because they're not really citizens, they're, they're not like everybody else. Even though we said all men are created equal, now nah, we can't count all of them. Because if we do, your numbers in the House of Representatives will be way bigger than ours. And we don't want to lose their power. So what they did, they came to a compromise called a three-fifths compromise. And they said, what we'll do is we'll count some of them. <laughs> we'll count three of every five of them. So if there's 50 of them, we'll give you credit for 30 of them for population purposes. The other 20 we'll just ignore. <laughs> So that was important because it maintained the balance of power between the North and the South. And so this balance of power was very important. And so when you look at this history and you say slavery as an institution, the importation of slaves, if the South could continue to import more slaves, their population would continue to grow. And the North didn't want that to happen. So they came to another compromise. It said, we will allow you to continue to import slaves <coughs> until January 1st, 1808. And at that point, it will be illegal to import slaves into the United States. Because the North knew that if they gave them 20 more years of doing this, that would be enough. They gave them more than 20 years, they would continue to have this representation problem moving forward. So they capped it at 20 years. January 1st, 1808 became illegal to import Africans into the United States legally. But it continued. Nobody really enforced the law. But nobody really cared. The South really didn't care because, well, you know, they were going to count the same, pretty much the same number of people because at that point, you weren't really importing that many people to begin with. The slave population grew simply by the nature of people having children. So it grew by that way. So you didn't really have to import a lot more people in. So that was another implication was this importation. And so that was an issue from 1787 that was a divisive issue, a very divisive issue, this issue of slavery. Imagine, when, go back to what I said about the word slave and slavery not being in the Constitution. It wasn't in there because they were too embarrassed to put it in there. That was number one. But there were ten places in the Constitution where slavery was directly affected by it. So imagine this. You have this issue in 1787 that's very divisive, that you know they're having these debates about it, debates, debates, debates. They draw up the Constitution, but the debate doesn't end there. It continues moving forward. Lincoln was well aware of this debate and this divisiveness, and so what he said was that, I hate the institution of slavery because it's wrong. It's wrong to treat people this way. Secondly, it's an issue that's dividing the nation. And remember, when, when, when Lincoln became president, excuse me, it was just a very short period later when those first shots were fired and the Civil War began. I mean, he barely had time to go into the Oval Office and get comfortable in the chair, and it was already a war start, right? So he knew that that was an issue that was dividing the nation. That's why he hated slavery. Now. How do you feel about the slaves? People like Joshua Glover. This is how he felt about him. He said it very openly. He was not shy about saying this. He said it on numerous occasions. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is look it up. Google it. Google Lincoln's views on slaves. Not slavery. <coughs> Lincoln's views on slaves. There was a very famous set of debates he had when he was in Illinois running for the Senate there with a man by the name of Stephen Douglas. He had these public debates and the newspapers reported on what was said. And, and Lincoln said on numerous occasions that he did not believe that blacks and whites should live in equality in America. He said very clearly that he believed that if we were to separate the powers and give powers to one group over the others, he would always side with whites over blacks. And as a result of that, he believed, and he said this to a, to a group of black leaders in 1862. He invited them to the White House to have a conversation, but there was no conversation. He basically told them this. For the benefit of your people, you need to go back to your people and tell them this. 
I don't believe that America will ever treat your people the way that they treat whites. I don't believe that blacks will ever live in equality in America. I don't think that it will ever happen. So, my advice to you, and take this back to your friends and your community, tell them I said this. If they want to live a good life, they need to leave America. They need to leave. They need to go somewhere else. Because as long as they stay here, I can guarantee you they will never live in equality here. He said whites in this country will never allow blacks to live in a state of equality with them. And that's the message he sent to these black leaders that he invited to the White House. His plan, and this was a plan he had talked about for many years and continued to talk about even during the middle of the Civil War. His plan was to do this. Colonize the black population of America somewhere outside of America. He wanted to not send us back to Africa, which many people <coughs> said, send them back to Africa. Even though at this particular time, most of them had never even seen Africa because their families had been in America for generation after generation. The first Africans arrived, most of us have heard, oh, the first Africans arrived in America in 1619. That's not true either. First Americans arrived in a British colony in America was in 1619, but they had been here already as an enslaved population under the Dutch since the 1500s. But Lincoln believed that in order for America to move forward and have peace and not have this divisive issue, that we had to get rid of the blacks. He said we should free the slaves and put them on ships and send them somewhere else. He actually got the federal government to agree to this. And they put aside some money to buy a piece of land in Panama, a little place called Chiriki, to buy a piece of land to send all of the blacks to after they were given their freedom. That was Lincoln's plan. Even though people around him was like, man, you must be crazy. This is crazy. There's like four million people. How are you going to send four million people to, to this little place? And so he tried to, 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 to see if they could buy some land in Haiti. The Haitian government said, we're not going to allow you to do that. And it's important that Haiti said that because Haiti was a place that was founded by slaves who basically revolted against the French, kicked their butts off the island, and said, we're starting our own government and the first free republic in the Americas outside of the U.S. was Haiti. And so Haiti said, we've, we fought against slavery. We fought against this tyranny where these people enslaved us and treated us horribly. And now all of a sudden, we're going to just let you kick these people out of the country? Are you kidding us? We're not going to do that. You must be crazy. And so Haiti was out. Panama was kind of too far away and, and too expensive. So even though he had put money aside to buy this land, they never were able to follow through on it. And eventually, in, in the last few months of his life, he kind of came to a different mindset about it. But he never, he never relinquished the idea of colonizing blacks outside the country. What he did say, and this is one of the things that led to his assassination, John Wilkes Booth said this. He said that he came to the decision to kill Lincoln because of these words that came out of his mouth. President Lincoln was reluctant to allow blacks to fight for the Union Army and Navy, even though people were pushing him. Frederick Douglass was always in his ear about it. Members of his cabinet were pushing, because for, for a majority of the Civil War, the North was losing. They were losing. They were getting their butts kicked by the South. And they knew that they had to have some help. And so eventually, he allowed blacks to fight, and it turned the course of the war. 180,000 blacks fought in the Union Army and about 20,000 in the Union Navy. Turned the course of the war. And Lincoln was shocked. He couldn't believe that these black men would fight so bravely, that they would be such good soldiers that they'd win all of these medals of honor. And so he looked at that and he said, wow, I'm really surprised. And I'm really very proud of these men for what they've done to help turn this war in our favor. So I'm going to reward them. I'm going to reward those men who fought by giving them 40 acres of the right to vote. 
Mm. I'm going to allow them to become citizens and vote. John Wilkes Booth heard that Lincoln said that, and he says, that's the day I decided to kill Lincoln. That's the day I decided to kill Lincoln. Because how can he have the audacity to give these slaves the right to vote and become citizens? Are you kidding me? I'm going to kill that man because of that. And that's exactly what he did. So, to kind of tie all this up, I believe very strongly that the issues we have as a nation when it comes to race are very powerful issues that still remain and they remain mainly because of two reasons. Number one, we don't like to talk about it. That's the number one reason. We are afraid to talk about it. And number two, and this is way more important to me, what we think we know about American history, we don't really know much about American history. Most of our beliefs about how race and racism works is based on bad information that all of us have gotten. And I'm not saying that it, it, because you had bad history teachers or, or, or the textbooks were bad or anything. That's just the way America has always presented itself. I always use this example, and I may have used it once before when I was here. As a parent, you have two children, and your one son is very good in school. He loves school. He goes on to college. He becomes a doctor, lawyer, and you're like, oh, my son did a wonderful job. And then you have another son who really, you know, didn't like school that much, may have dropped out. Went from dead-end job to dead-end job, became an alcoholic, maybe a drug addict, and as a parent, this is what we do. We're hypocrites. This is what we do as parents. The son who became the doctor, we're always, he became a doctor because of such a wonderful job that my wife and I did. <laughs> we're wonderful parents. And then that son that became the alcoholic and the drug addict, <clears throat> this is what we say as parents. He just made bad choices. We gave him every opportunity just like his brother. He made bad choices. We don't take responsibility for the bad, but we love to take responsibility for the good. That's what America has done since day one. We look back and, 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 and we celebrate all of these wonderful things about this great republic that was founded by the founding fathers and freedom and justice and liberty and all of these wonderful things. We celebrate it all the time. We celebrate the 4th of July and we have firework displays all over the country and we just love talking about the great stuff. But when it comes to talking about the crap, excuse my French, we don't like to talk about it. We buried under a rug and we pretend it didn't happen. Or we say this. And man, if I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say this, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd be on some island in the Pacific, <laughs> chilling, drinking some, not bottled water, but some real water. <laughs> if I had a dollar for every time somebody said this, it's in the past. We need to let the past go. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> Nonsense. You want to let the past go? Stop talking about George Washington chopping down a cherry tree. <laughs> Stop talking about Abraham Lincoln is a great emancipator. We love talking about whatever the past we want to talk about, but when it's bad stuff, so, oh, it's in the past. We need to let it go. We need to heal ourselves by letting it go. Nonsense! You don't heal yourself by letting it go. As an alcoholic or a drug addict, you don't go to Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous and say, uh, I'm going to talk about all the good stuff, but I'm going to ignore the fact that, man, I was just smoking some weed right before I came to the meeting. You're going to talk about, man, I slipped up and I smoked the joint before I came. That's what real healing is, admitting the bad stuff. We as a country don't want to do it. We think it makes us look bad. It makes us look bad for not doing it. We cannot heal the problems of America unless we're willing to honestly talk about them. And it's not a reflection on us. It really isn't. It's a reflection on what we've been taught by everybody that we've ever been involved with. Doesn't mean that they were bad people for, for, for teaching us these things or leaving things out of the history books, that doesn't make them bad people. But it makes us ignorant people. Ignorant doesn't mean dumb or stupid. Ignorant means a lack of good information. We don't have enough good information about the history of race or racism, and we don't understand it. And so, what I want to do for you guys as a result of that, I'm coming back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> give you some of that information that you need. I call it brain food. I'm going to be back here in two weeks to talk about 
this pseudoscience called eugenics, which has impacted the world, impacted U.S. history, the history of Europe. It's going to be an eye-opening experience for those of you who aren't familiar with it. It's such a crazy thing when you look back on it now when you look back and see what it was and how it evolved and, and the things that they said and the things that they taught and the things that people believed, you look and you're like, how could people have been that crazy? But that's the way it was. And so just to kind of give you guys just a, a brief teaser about it, eugenics was a pseudoscience that purported that we as people in any particular society have a right to demand that we continue to exist. And the way we continue to exist is to make sure that the people that we have children with are people that we should have children with. We want to make better babies. We want to make sure that the people who are allowed to have children are the people who are successful in society, people who are educated. We don't want imbeciles having babies. And I'll tell you guys a very interesting story about a young woman who was called an imbecile. So this group of scientists and, and leading figures from academia all over the country got together and they talked about these things and they helped set policy in states and on the federal level to make sure that certain people would not be allowed to have children. And they pushed a certain segment of society to have even more children. Because they believed, very strongly believed this, that good with good leads to good. Good with bad leads to bad. Bad with bad leads to worse. And so they wanted to make sure that everybody who became a parent was a good person. Because we didn't want a bad person messing up the gene pool. Now they didn't call it genes back then. They called it blood. Good blood and good blood leads to good blood. And so these things that they talked about, which were very prominent around the United States of America, led other people in other countries to talk about them as well. The British were kind of the ones who, who, who founded the movement, but it became really, really prevalent in the United States and these ideas spread to other places. And one of the groups that really grabbed a hold of these ideas and ran with it in a different direction than anybody had ever run with it before were the National Socialist Party in Germany, also known as the Nazis. <laughs> and what they did with it embarrassed the eugenics movement and made it not necessarily disappear, but go underground. So we're going to talk about that because I think that's very relevant for us as Americans, black, white, whatever group we may belong to, because it affected everybody. Because any particular person could have a finger placed on them and say that you are not a person that should have a child. Anybody could have been picked. And there was nothing you could do about it. If they picked you, they put you in this select group and said you can't have a child, you couldn't. And we'll talk about how that worked. Because it's very important. The other thing I want to share, this last thing, I'm very passionate about race and racism because I think that it's something that once we get comfortable talking about it, once we get enough valuable information, then we can go about the next step of the process which is to begin healing. You can't heal what you don't know. If you have cancer inside of your body and you don't know it, you can't heal it. Racism is America's cancer. It's been spreading throughout our bodies. The only difference, though, is we've known about it. It's not as if we didn't know. Americans have known about racism since 1787 with the Constitution. They wrote racism right into the document. But this is what they did. And this is why we're so sick today. They ignored it. They ignored the issue. They tried to talk around it by not mentioning slave or slavery. The Confederate States of America, that group that we were fighting in the Civil War, or as the Southerners call it, the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> they drew up a constitution also. They almost copied the U.S. Constitution word for word, with one big exception. When they were talking about slaves, 
they use the word slave. Mm -hmm. When they talk about slavery, they use the word slavery. They were honest. They were not. Listen, we know who we are. We're not going to pretend to be someone else. We're not going to be hypocrites. But the U.S. founding fathers, and I hate to say this, but they were hypocrites. There was nothing wrong with them putting those words in that document because they knew that it existed, but it kind of would have been against these principles that they stood for about freedom, justice, and liberty. So they, they couldn't make themselves look like hypocrites, so they tried to hide it in the language, in that beautiful flowing language they use. But when you look at it, you say to yourself, this is why the problem still exists. They hid it at the beginning, and we haven't had really open, honest dialogue about it. We haven't learned enough about it. So I'm, I'm going to come back uh, probably sometime in May, and I want to do a series on race. It'll probably be probably two or three different events because I want to do I want to go over a detailed history of the concept of race, where the concept comes from, talk about in detail whether or not it's it's a biological construct or a social construct. There's debates about it back and forth. And I also want to show how the concept of race reared its ugly head and became racism. Because we don't really know where it came from. We just assume it's always been there, but it hasn't. It's developed by people making very intimate decisions about how to treat people based on any particular set of identity that they chose. We can label people any way we want. And this is one of the things that happens. There's a great book that I read called Blaming the Victim. And it says that this is, this is the process <coughs> of victimizing people. Creating a situation where you are allowed to victimize somebody and justify it. This is what you do. You study that particular group, you find something that they share in common, and then you label that a problem. You label it as a problem after labeling it as a problem. So you look at something that they have in common, you say that's a problem. And then you say, that's what's wrong with you, because you have this problem. And it makes it very easy for you to justify treating people very poorly. And we'll look at how a Back lot of people... Back to your session, please. The public library is closing promptly at 8 o'clock. If you have any materials to check out, please do so now. So we're going to look at... Social shutdown at 755. We'll look at how that process is played out, particularly here in America, and how the ideas of race have led to racism and how it's a continuing, ongoing issue. And uh, I'm hoping that all of you come back and bring somebody with you. I always used to tell this to people at the museum, come back and visit us, bring friends, family members, coworkers, enemies, strangers, <laughs> anybody, bring somebody with you. Yes, ma'am. Aren't you going to be here on 26 Yes, I'll be on the 26th doing a piece on eugenics and I'll be back in May to do a series of events on the history of race and racism. So, please come back. Yes, sir. Uh, have you uh, read the book, you know, by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would recommend, because a lot of the things here, the history taking place because her husband was a prosecutor and, and he deferred her a long time not to write the book, but that's exactly what's happening in our prison system. I'm going to tell you something about that book. I bought the book, I read it, I love the book, but I hate that book. Let me tell you why I hate it. Because I started writing that exact same book back in 1996, but I never finished. My book was called Casualties of War, America's Drug War and Its Effect on Young Black Males. I was writing that book. But too stupid to finish it, and I'm still mad at myself. Just wait a couple of years. <laughs> My wife keeps telling me, what's stopping you from writing it down? Yeah, like, everyone.